And at this stage, just to get a little bit of background about Recom and what it's all about, I'm going to ask Finn Tarp and Eve Peterson to join me over here, and also Lena Engelstrom from Sweden. Okay, first of all, if I could begin with you, Eve. I mean, it all began here. So how did Recom come about? Recom came about uh, a couple of years ago. We just got a new minister at that point. He was not that experienced in development cooperation, but he was very engaged, and um, he said, I want to do this as, as, as good as possible, create the best results. So what do we actually know about what works and what doesn't work? Uh, and we started explaining, and he said, this is too much, uh, too complicated what you're telling me. Let's put in, uh, in place a program where we can actually uh, assemble all the knowledge in the world, Forget make a few uh, more studies, and get really a lot of uh, empirical data uh, to make our uh, policy decisions on. So this is actually how we started. Okay, and okay, Global Research Network seems to be a fit, but how did Wider get involved? In, in 2009, Wider got a new senior management and we had to put in place a new work program. This became known as the Triple Crisis Work Program on finance, development finance, food and climate change. And the thoughts that we had put into the development finance pillar fitted quite well with what Ibe was describing. So when we were approached and asked whether we would go in and take the lead, we said, fine, match. Sounds good. And Sweden, obviously, was one of the, well, you're the main, another, the co-main donor on this. So how did Sweden get involved? Yes, uh, Sweden, uh, through the, the government's development agency, SIDA, we uh, heard about uh, the program uh, that Danida initiated with uh, Recom. So, and since we are very interested in aid efficiency and what works, we decided to join. Um, and uh, we saw initially that there were some challenges, especially in the communications. But now we have a communications officer in place and we see improvements already. Uh, although we still have some uh, challenges remaining in terms of how to disseminate the outcomes of the, the, the conferences and the, the seminars. Okay, well, all input from that will be useful today. Focusing first of all on the research though and on the results, um, there is and today we are focusing specifically on jobs. Now, Denmark was again a pioneer in sort of the public-private mm -hmm. partnership concept. Eve, can you tell me a little bit about how that fits into the results communication equation of Recom? Well, I think uh, it fits quite well. Um, as you said, we have been working with, uh, with private uh, companies, uh, public-private partnership for many years, and I think it's obvious that um, a lot of, well, the growth and the jobs to, to create development, they have to come from the private sector. So you need to involve that. And, and uh, we have some experience in that. Uh, and therefore, also I think it fits uh, quite well into uh, to the Recom program. Sweden also likes the PPI approach. Yes, we do. And we also have a, a, a strong push from our, I mean, the, the government to work more closely with the private sector. And that makes a good sense because involvement of private sector is essential to actually do pro poor growth. And in this case, also to work with gro job creation and employment, as we see that as a very important thing, since we need to close the gap between basic education and employment. So... Job creation is very important. And Finn, it's almost a mantra. I've heard it so many times since um, starting to work with, on this project. The data isn't there. There's, there's just not enough data about employment and aid. Um, I, I mean, last night, just talking again with a, a baby, uh, that was my thought going to bed. There's just been such a dearth of employment. I know the World Development Report has done a lot, and you all have done a lot to answer that. But the challenges, therefore, on, on getting all of this together. I know it's one, one part of what RECOM does, but... RECOM is organized under five major themes, and obviously there are gaps. Obviously there are things where we hesitate as researchers to say that here we have solid evidence. This does not, however, mean that there are not areas where we can say that there is some evidence 
to point in the right directions. And when there are no data, we're actually pretty good at trying to figure out how reality might actually look. At least we can think about a range of possibilities, and that can then, in turn, inform our thinking about what might work and what we should improve and what might work in one context and we could be transferred to another. The lack of data is something that we live with, but that's something we are pretty good at analyzing. And I'm hoping today we'll demonstrate that there are things we can indeed say. Eve, coming back to you and the private sector, just let's put a little flesh on this. Mm -hmm. Tell me a couple of stories about how it's actually happened and the kind of results that you've seen, because let's start giving people a taste of some of the results. And forgive my back, everybody. <laughs> well, I think um, we've we worked at this for, for a number of years for, for several reasons, actually. Um, first of all, as I said, uh, the growth has to come from the private sector. The jobs, are, uh, has, they have to be created there. Um, and related to this, I think increasingly, and this is something that we're going to talk about in the post-2015 agenda and so on, you cannot look at aid as the uh, answer to, to um, to all development challenges. You need uh, finance, uh, financing from other places. Aid, we, will, we would like to see aid as a catalyst for creating things. So that started a few years ago. One of the first major ones uh, we, we initiated uh, um, was with some uh, institutional investors because we thought this was uh, eight years ago, and at that time, Borrowing interest rates minute. were also low, um, even though they were not as low as they are today. But, but at that time, we thought it might be in interesting. It should be interesting for companies, institutional investors, to go and invest in, in some of these new markets. So we started talking with some of the pension schemes. We <coughs> turned out two of them, then partnered with uh, one of the major uh, asset management companies. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to interrupt you there, yeah? because we just happen to have. I'm really surprised. <laughs> And where are you, Niels? Niels Thyssen was uh, involved very much with the uh, Led the Bank Invest. Could you briefly just tell us that story? Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's a good example of how uh, a public-private partnership can, can work and how uh, Danita, uh, with uh, a contribution, actually was a catalyst for direct impact investments, uh, which uh, uh, was more than tenfold of that investment. From the start, uh, Danita uh, supported uh, a, a private equity fund with the purpose of direct in impact investments in Danita program countries. Not only investment, but also supporting management in these companies with uh, uh, just below 10 million US dollars. On that basis, there was raised a, a first fund on, uh, on 100 million US dollars, and that led to a total uh, to, to additional follow-on funds without support of Danita, totaling about 500 million US dollars. So 10 million dollar uh, million US dollars actually catalyzed 500 million US dollars in direct uh, impact investments, where local management was supported to develop uh, those companies. And I think that's a perfect example of how it works. And um, uh, clients are, uh, of these funds are today both Danish pension funds as well as international pension funds. And you wouldn't have done it without Danita, right? No, that, uh, that actually, uh, that was an important catalyst. It could not have happened without. Thank you very much. So coming back, Lena, have you got, uh, and I'll give you back your mic, any comparable sort of stories? Well, uh, the supply of skilled workers is uh, one of the main challenges to uh, actually reach increased production and also uh, pro-poor growth in low- and middle-income countries. So that is why now CIDA is supporting two public-private partnerships where we target skills development and employment in now uh, we are in uh, Iraq and Ethiopia, and we will also soon be in Bangladesh, Tanzania, and Liberia. And these are actually good examples of direct, direct cooperation with multinational uh, companies, uh, which will create job opportunities and income generation. Okay, no, you can keep it for now. Eve, I want to I wanna sort of drill down a little bit, because we've heard about the big one. But there are some smaller, more human stories. I, I think I'm, I, I'm not wearing a sweater, but that would be a good hint. Yeah, well, uh, we have uh, several examples, but I think I've recently visited uh, Bolivia, where Morten is working, and uh, I, um, we visited uh, 
a company there, a local knitwear company, uh, and they have, through our uh, Danida uh, business partnership program, teamed up with a Danish company, design company, uh, in production of uh, very nice um, uh, products for, for the European market. So they increased their product, uh, production. Uh, they have now a factory with, uh, I think, uh, more than 100 workers. And a very good aspect as well is that they teamed up with a number of women, uh, I think more than 200 women, who are knitting at home. Uh, they get the, 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 the <coughs> product out there, and then they are knitting and, and providing. So they actually make uh, an income uh, while still being able to, to cater for some of the other business uh, they have to do. Uh, so I think it's a very good example that actually with small means uh, you can you can uh, uh, you can create jobs. Thank you. Now forgive my back. Now for you, you know, Recom is all about research and communication. And in today, what we're going to be doing too is not just focusing on the research, but the results of the research. So I think you're going to be hearing some stuff that maybe will change your minds on some of the preconceptions that you had about employment and jobs in the developing world. But the calm bit, the communications bit, that obviously has been an area where we are moving forward. So I know Wider, and I'm sorry, I'm taking words out of your mouth, Finn, I have a habit of doing that. Wider got me involved, so I'm doing part of the communications bit. But why are communications important? And there I will ask, first of all, Finn and then Lena. And I think, I mean, sorry, not Finn, Eeb, apologies, Eeb and Lena, internally and externally. Well, you're right in pointing to the dual um, uh, reasons for having uh, such a high uh, priority to the communication. We need to be able to communicate that we are achieving some results. We need to be able to communicate that to both the beneficiaries, but also the Danish taxpayers who are paying for the assistance. But we also need communication internally, as you say, exactly uh, to, to become more knowledgeable of, about what works and how did we achieve those results. So these are the dual objectives that we need to, to address through our communication, uh, also around this uh, program, but certainly also in, in everything else that we are doing as a development agency. Thank you. And Lena, I know you talked about this at the beginning, but I'm yeah, asking you to come yeah, back yes, on the it. It's the importance important. of communication, and I really share what, what it said. We need to be accountable to, to the constituency, to the taxpayers, but we also need it to actually learn and to draw the conclusions and to do things differently. And we, ne we need to be innovative, we need to be flexible, but to be able to do that, we need to learn a little bit from our experiences. So we need to go forward with more knowledge, but more risk-taking and more brave. Okay, risk-taking. Finn, I'm going to ask you to finalize this note, taking a risk on communications. For somebody who spent half his working life in developing countries, it's obviously important that knowledge just sits there. Knowledge need be, needs to be used. You very often have a big challenge of using the knowledge. Part of using the knowledge that does exist better is communication. You do that when you're communicating in audiences, this is this one. You do that when wider holds conferences where we communicate on other topics. We do that in our project meetings. We also do that through our publications. So communication is a very big thing. But for me, the core of the matter is knowledge may sit there, but if you don't communicate it, it's not going to be useful in policy or otherwise. Thank you very much.